Sending back both of you, uh, sending them back to you, and with them comes my own heart. I wanted to keep them here with me while I'm in these chains for the preaching of the good news, and he would have helped me on your behalf. But I didn't want to do anything without your consent. I wanted you to help because you were willing, not because you were forced. It seems you lost Onesimus for a little while, so that you could have him back forever. He's no longer a slave to you; he is more than a slave, for he is a beloved brother, especially to me. Now he will mean much more to you, both as a man and as a brother in the Lord. Thank you, Devin. It is always great to be with you at St. Mary's Chapel. And today we're talking about Paul's shortest letter and what it has to teach us. Uh, the book of Philemon is unique in the kind of pantheon of Pauline literature in that it is a letter to an individual who is not another minister. Timothy and Titus are the individuals, but this one's to uh, a, a, just a church member, an average person. And it deals with a case where Paul is imprisoned in Rome. He's under house arrest. He's awaiting trial before Nero. Uh, this is the, the famous journey at the end of the book of Acts where he journeys to Rome. Uh, but uh, while he is there, he meets and then... Uh, shares the gospel with a runaway slave named Onesimus. Now, uh, when we hear the word slave, when we talk about slavery, our mind immediately goes to the American context of that from the, you know, the 19th century and, and back. And I, and I want to kind of move us from that mindset into the ancient Roman and Greco-Roman world mindset. Uh, uh, the two big differences there between slavery in the American context and that context is one, uh, there's no racial element to this kind of slavery. Anyone from any background, any part of the Roman Empire could become slaves in these times. Uh, so that there is no racial element here. In fact, both men have Greek names, so it's likely they both are of at least some Greek descent. Uh, the other element, too, is how somebody became a slave. We typically think of slavery as, you know, one person goes to a faraway place, captures someone, and brings them back to slavery. And the Romans did something similar in that one way you became a slave was you uh, were a prisoner of war. Uh, but that's probably not the case here. In fact, it's almost certainly not. That was kind of going out of style, not happening as much by the time of the New Testament. Most likely, Philemon, or Onesimus, excuse me, became uh, a slave for one of two means. Either uh, he was born a slave, which is possible, or what I think is probably most likely is he was what was called a, a bond servant. In our modern English, we would call this an indentured servant, where uh, either he got into debt with someone else or got into great debt with Philemon. He couldn't afford uh, to survive outside of, uh, because of this great weight of debt he was under. And so what he would do in this case is he would go to Philemon, who we know was a more wealthy man, and say, listen, if you'll pay my debt over here with this third party, or if you'll forgive my debt with you, uh, what we will, I'll do is I will work off my debt to you. I will be your servant. That's why uh, the Greek word to be lost in my Bible, uh, the word that, that Devin's version translates slaves, is actually translated bond servant, because it, it kind of has that idea of indentured servitude, and we get that, right? I mean, it, it's what happens basically every time we go to the car dealership, right? Hey, I'm going to get way in debt to you, but I'm going to work it off and pay it back. So that's what happens here. 
And I want to show you just a couple quick things that this passage teaches us. Because as uh, Onesimus got to Rome, he met, meets Paul, he becomes a Christian, he realizes there's a problem now. He had most likely promised Philemon, I will pay back my debt to you. Not only did he not pay back his debt, but in the context of the book of Philemon, there's an implication that he probably took something of uh, Philemon's as he left. Onesimus very likely could have taken money. Perhaps he took a possession that he then sold to finance his journey to Rome. But, but he, he has not only not paid his debt to Philemon, he has now in, sinned against him, stolen something of some sort, and then ran away to Rome to hide. So when he becomes a Christian with Paul, there's suddenly this idea that, well, I need to go back and make this right. I need to go back and ask for forgiveness and, and, and correct my mistake. And so the first thing that happens here, and I'll, I'll read it from kind of the end of the passage. And this is, this is verse 17. Paul says, and this is just after what Deborah read. So if you consider me your partner, receive him as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, Charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay you. To say nothing of the fact of your owing me, even your own self. So what Paul is saying here is he's saying, listen, if this guy still owes you any outstanding debt, if this man stole anything from your house, took any possession of value, charge that to me. Let me pay that for him so that he can be made right with you. And that's the first thing I want us to see out of this passage, is that this passage shows us the gospel. You see, like Onesimus had sinned against Philemon and ran away from him, each one of us has sinned against God and ran away from him. And like Paul loved Onesimus, saying he'd become Paul's very heart, as Devin read for us, so we were loved by Christ to the point that he would give up his life for us. And like Paul told Philemon to charge to his account all of Onesimus' debt, so Jesus allowed all of our sins and the debt that incurs to be charged to his account on the cross. And just like Paul returned the runaway uh, bondservant Onesimus to Philemon as a new member of the family, a, a brother in Christ, more than a bondservant, as Paul says, so Jesus returns runaway sinners like you and I to God's family no longer as servants, or just servants, but as full members, brothers and sisters. The first thing that this passage shows us is the gospel. And that's an important reminder, I think. Paul's life had been transformed by the gospel. And so had Philemon's, and so had Onesimus's. But it wasn't enough just to believe it. They had to live it out in this drama that we see here. But we need to look at something else. Is the fact that with the gospel, everything changes. The first thing that changes is that the gospel brings us purpose. Look back at verse 11 uh, through 13, which uh, Devin read for us just a second ago. Paul says, formerly he, that's Onesimus, was useless to you. But now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I'm sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I prefer to do nothing but after consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion but of your own accord. What is he saying here? Well, Paul is, is being clever. He's making a play on words. Onesimus, the Greek name, actually means useful. Now, I don't know if this is a nickname or if it's just the biggest coincidence in the world. We don't know. But uh, Onesimus means useful. So Paul is saying, you know, back when this guy had to get up at sunrise and do whatever you told him to all day, he was useless to you. But now because of the gospel, he's useful to you and me. How is it that the gospel conveys this usefulness? Well, I have an illustration for you. I mean, I'm going to have to step off camera just one second because I left my illustration sitting on the uh, front pew. This is my brand new iPhone. And by brand new, I mean it's two models old, but it's new to me. All right. What is this? Anybody tell me? Yeah. This is the easiest question you'll be asked all day on a university campus. What is this? Cell. It's a cell phone? Is that what this is? No, it's a selfie. It's, oh, a selfie? No, no, no. What, what, what is this? This device I hold in my hand. What is this? Anybody? Anyone? A smartphone. A smartphone. Wait, no, it's not. It's, 
a brick. It's it's a this is this is a calculator, isn't it? Right? I mean, look look at this. Isn't this a, a calculator? I mean, I can like look. I'm going to put in these numbers and I'm going to divide and that didn't divide equally, but you get the idea. That's that's all this is, isn't it? Is a a calculator? Wait a minute. Are you guys who are just being a super responsive audience and really helping this illustration right now? Are you guys telling me that I can be more than just this is more than a calculator? Wait a minute. What what are all these contacts? Hey, wait, this is a dial like a phone. You mean I can use this thing to call people? What have I been doing with these things since 2010? Now, obviously, I know this is a cell phone, right? I'm old, I'm not that old. Okay. But here's the deal, guys. So many times in our lives, we take our life, which God means to be full of purpose and meaning and seeking and showing his glory and knowing him and making him known. God has made us for a great thing, which is a relationship with him and magnifying him. And do you know what we do with life? We make it about the calculator. We say, oh, I'm going to go into this career and that's who I am and that's who I'll be. And that'll be my purpose. That'll be my meaning. I'm going to have this awesome romantic relationship, and that relationship defines me and who I am and who it's going to be. And when it ends in six months, I'm going to be really depressed and listen to country music for a while. Guys, when we walk away from the gospel, which restores us to a relationship with Christ and the fullness of knowing him and walking with him and showing God's glory, can I, can I tell you what happens when we make life about those other things? It's like having the most powerful Smartphone that ever existed is being like, oh, it's a calculator. We're making it about just this one small thing. You see, the gospel makes us useful. And not just useful, useful to God in his plans for the world and for eternity. That's an awesome thing. And so that brings us to a question. Have we embraced the gospel? And if you answer that, yes, I have, then you have a purpose. You have. Use. Secondly, the gospel brings fellowship that transcends society. Look at verses 15 and 16. This is where Paul says, For perhaps this is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever. By the way, as a bond servant, Onesimus would most likely have been able at some point to get his freedom. Uh, he might have earned enough money to, to buy his freedom back or to pay for him and all, or he may have just walked off his debt. And look what happens. In verse 16, no longer as a bondservant, but as more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. The gospel brought a new fellowship between Onesimus and Philemon. Their, their relationship was no longer a work relationship. It was no longer a bondservant and, and, and master, you know, the, the man who had bought his debt. No. Their relationship was that they were brothers in Christ. And by the way, the gospel does the same thing for us. It transcends every division of society, whether it is, it's racial, whether it's economic, whether it's you know, our standing on camp, our popularity, whatever it is, whether it's our marital status, single marriage. The gospel transcends all those things, all those little ways that society and culture, and really in our culture, become obsessed with and kind of break us down and divide us and say, this separates, this divides, you're over here, you're over there. What the gospel does is it teaches us that we are all created in God's image, Genesis chapter 2, that we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, Romans 3, but that we can all be saved and restored to him by grace through faith, and this not of ourselves, it's the gift of God, lest anyone should boast, Ephesians chapter 2. What the gospel does is it takes all those divisions, it mows them down, and it gives us fellowship with one another where we can have true brotherly love, friendship, and intimacy, not only with God, but with one another. The last thing the gospel changes us. The gospel makes forgiveness imperative. One more time, I'm going to read for you verse 19. Look at verse 19 says, I, Paul, write this with my own hand. That was a big deal. Back in the day, back in ye olden time, very often what you would do is you'd have a secretary guy who wrote out your letters as you just kind of dictated to them. And then you, the letter writer, the, the, the author, the one who told them what to write, would just kind of sign your name at the end to prove it was you who sent the letter. 
this is very personal for Paul. This is Paul wanting uh, Philemon to know, hey, I care about this so much, I'm taking the time to write this myself. By the way, writing took forever back then. If you've ever taken a Greek class, believe me, it took forever. All right? But look what Paul says. I write this to you with my own hand. I will repay it. That's him saying, I'll pay whatever debt's owed. To say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Now, part of me wants to say that that was Paul going, uh, well, you know you owe me. But, look a little deeper. Paul was the one, based on the letter we know, Paul was the one who had shared the gospel with Philemon in the first place. He, he was the one who brought him to Christ. And so what Paul was reminding Philemon of is, hey, there was a time in your life where you needed the gospel and you needed to be forgiven, and you were. And how could Philemon, if he looked at his relationship with God, said, you know, I had sinned against the holy God, the God of the universe, whose law I had broken, whose will I had gone outside. If he, who is completely just, who has to deal with sin, has to punish sin, made forgiveness possible for me in Christ, Philemon would have to think, well, who am I to not forgive the sin that Onesimus com committed against me, who is just as imperfect as any other man. And guys, there's a great lesson there for us. I think it's a really powerful lesson. It is the gospel that makes forgiveness imperative. Because we have been forgiven. It should, it should be a joy for us to forgive, to show grace like God has shown us grace. It's something that Christ talks about. It's something that Paul here is talking about. The gospel makes forgiveness imperative. Because let me ask you something. When you look back on your life, if you're being completely honest, which it's good to be honest at least with yourself if you can. When you look back on your life, when you think about the things that you're like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done this. Gosh, if I could take that back. Man, I'm going to regret this or that for forever. Knowing that God in his grace and love forgave us of all of that. How long, even I dare say hypocritical, I know that's a word we don't like to toss out in our culture, but how hypocritical of us would it be to say, you know what though, the way that person spoke to me the other day, I'm going to hold that against them forever. It would be wrong. The gospel demands forgiveness. So what do we see here? We see a beautiful picture of the Bible. Paul demonstrating how Christ steps in and just like Paul allowed Onesimus' debt to be charged to his account, Christ does the same for us. And we see that once we embrace the gospel, that the gospel changes everything. The gospel brings us purpose. It makes us useful. The gospel brings fellowship that transcends society despite all the things that society says should divide us. And the gospel makes forgiveness imperative that we should forgive the way we have been forgiven. That's the impact of the gospel, and that's the impact of Paul's shortest letter. You just got taught the entire book of Philemon. Congratulations, guys. All right, I'm going to pray to end this, and then we will be done for this edition of Centenary Chapel. Thank you so much for coming out. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father God, thank you for this short little book. Father God, it's, it's not the longest book. It's, I think, 23 verses, if I remember correctly. But there's so much packed in here. From a beautiful picture of the gospel, a beautiful picture of Christian forgiveness, and the impact that the gospel can have in our lives. It can make us useful, giving us purpose and meaning. It can teach us to forgive the way you've forgiven us. And that it can bring us fellowship. That we can have real friendship, real relationship, through gospel relationships with our fellow Christians. Father God, I pray that these uh, truths will be something that we live in. I pray for these students. School is already not fun. I pray that you'll give them energy for class and tests and everything they're going to face the rest of the school. And all this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you all for joining us.